Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 154th episode of the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher. I hope everyone is doing well. Today is the last Tuesday of September, so you know what that means, Top 10 Tuesday. But because I want to stick to my specialty coding spotlight, last week I did gastro, this week I'm going to do cardio. I'm actually going to do top five today, and then at some point I'm going to add another five. Because cardiology, as you know, is my number one specialty. But I don't want this to be webinar-like, and I don't want it to be a training session, so you're sitting in your car going, really? I want it to be more, again, conversation, because it's a podcast. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that come to me as coding questions, but break it down in a way that hopefully you'll understand what you're looking for in a report, or you'll understand what somebody's having if you, when you, they come into the office or in the ER, um, but in a cardiology setting. So I do have some top five information that I do want to talk to you about. And then I'm going to talk to you about, there's a coding question that came in about the 2021 prolonged service code. We had a placeholder and now we actually have a code But just as I suspected, CPT and AMA differ on the interpretation of that code. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit and then just uh, really get started and hopefully close out the month on a positive note. So I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, It's been a a definite interesting month to say the least uh, for everybody between fires and heat and the unrest in the world and just everything that's going on. It's just uh, definitely a challenge just to get things going. So I'm hoping that everyone is really trying to stay positive as they can. One good thing is I'm starting to see um, different states open up now. So Florida, for example, opened up their entire state. There's no lockdown at all. It's completely opened. And they just asked, asked everybody to use, you know, good judgment when it comes to wearing masks in, you know, closed spaces with more than 10 people and just being responsible as far as, um, certain social distancing, if you don't know the people and things like that, but they're saying, go live your life and we'll just figure out what we need to do since it now is a 99.6 recovery rate, even for people that are over, um, 69 years old. So this is a good thing. Hopefully other states will follow. I'm in California. They're already talking about electric cars in 15 years and we can't even keep the lights on here. So who knows what we're doing out in Cali, but uh, it's a little weird out here. But anyway, hopefully everybody else uh, is getting a little bit more positive. Okay, so let's go ahead and really talk about cardio. So first of all, when I talk about cardiology, I like to break things down to a level where I think even sometimes the most seasoned coder can really sometimes get lost in the coding process instead of really looking at the clinical side of what they're doing. And I realize most coders don't have clinical, you have more terminology, but sometimes it can be really helpful if you know why something's being done instead of the fact that it's just being done, because that can help you in the long run, look for certain diagnoses. It can help you look for medical necessity. And, you know, is the, did the physician actually do this service versus that service? So the first one is left heart calf, and you might see the acronym LHC, which also means left heart calf. And remember, when we are looking at the cath lab uh, procedures, we're looking at blood flow and what's happening with um, the blood flow and the uh, any kind of obstructions or occlusions that could stop oxygen and blood from getting to the heart. When we get into the electrophysiology side, that's more the computer of the heart. So we're really looking now for blood flow and when, you know, calcium and and cholesterol buildup happens, what happens to, to that part of the heart. So a heart cath is considered a diagnostic procedure. And what that means, whenever you hear me say diagnostic, it means you're still looking for a problem. So it's not just um, contrast injections, or it's not just to set up the procedure. And incidental, I guess is the word I was looking for. It's not that. It means that you're going in to identify a potential problem. Now, one of the things that is confusing is that there are different cardiac cath codes. There's actually, I think, about 17 of them that you have to consider to determine what you're going to code for. But I want to focus on two that are, that are the most routine. And one is 93458, and the other one is 93454. Now, the first one that I said, 93458, you can tell I'm kind of out of numerical sequence. That is the one that basically inc- includes coronary injections 
and also possibly a left ventricular injection. So that means we're injecting dye into the left ventricle and going into the heart instead of stopping, uh, stopping short of the heart and just injecting the coronaries. So the 93454 is exactly that. It means we're not going into the heart and we are stopping short of the heart and just injecting the coronaries, which come off the aorta. Now, if you provide these services in a facility setting, so not in the place of service 11, then you need a 26 modifier. So if you don't have your own lab or you're billing global and you're billing globally, then you don't have to put on that modifier. But if you don't and you are providing this service in the hospital setting or facility setting that you don't own, then you have to build a professional component, which is either 93458, 26 or 93454. So let me explain, first of all, what you're looking for in a report. So the first you're looking for access. So do they go into the radial artery, which is the wrist? Do they access through the brachial, which is the arm? Do they access through the um, right or left common femoral, which is the leg or the lower extremity? And then they position that catheter into that structure and go up and over, they call it, uh, into the heart. They usually go through the aorta and they need to to get into the heart. And then um, they, after they're done, they pull it back and come back out the sheath or where they started. So that is also something that's included in a heart cath, introduction, positioning, and repositioning of that catheter. And then dye is injected and somebody can, the physician or the provider can see it on the screen and determine where the disease or blockages or lesions are so that they can then decide how to treat it. So let's say that your physician went in and injected the coronaries but didn't inject in the left ventricle. So a lot of practices will then, and coders will only code the 93454 26 modifier because it says without um, left ventriculography. But let's say that your physician did put something in there that says LVEDP, that acronym, or left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So what that means is that pressure that they're measuring as they actually do cross over the aortic valve and go into the heart they're trying to identify the patient's hemodynamics and their risk for developing late clinical, possibly um, heart failure, and they're five times more likely to get that. And so they're looking to see what those symptoms are for that potential heart failure. And so the only thing that you have to be careful of, so if you do have that, that's why they say, you know, LV gram if performed, because it might not be, but you still may go into the heart and you're entitled to that extra money. And you still may measure pressures, and that would still be a 93458. Typically, during a acute a heart attack, you probably wouldn't inject the left ventricle at that moment. Sometimes they'll do it at the end, but for the most part, I'm seeing that more as a coronary angiography. Now, let's say that you had a patient that had a heart cath already, both the coronaries were injected, plus they had an LV gram. And then at a later time, let's say they didn't find anything, so they didn't move on with the intervention they decided that the patient or the patient came back in with other sign or symptoms and they went back in, maybe shortness of breath and, you know, chest pain. They went back in and injected the coronaries only. That would be the 93454. Again, as long as it's diagnostic, you can bill for it. The other thing I just want to make sure that you don't overcode on. So let's say you do find the LVE DP or you find where they just give you, you know, pressures. Well, if that, the left ventricular pressures, well, just make sure from the narrative in the report that it's not from a previous echo. Sometimes I've seen that in there and I'll have a coder with something I'm auditing for a payer and I'll go back to the coder, go back to the practice and they'll be like, oh, you know, this was from the, uh, in, they went one into the heart and I'm going, I don't see that in here, but it does say the previous echo stipulated I'm like, oh shoot. So you want to make sure you know that that was from an actual procedure from a catheter perspective instead of from something previous. Okay. Now, sometimes during a heart cath, this is number two, a physician may say they did an aortography. Now, that's a very generic comment. Sometimes that's all you get. Well, you would hope they would say something like, like maybe an aortic root injection, which is right as you come out of the aorta. But if they don't, and all they say is aortography and your geographic imaging or your results says that they were coming out of the aorta and they give you ascending aorta information, then that would be a supervalvular aortography or the injection procedure code add on 93567. Now you don't need a 26 modifier in this because it's procedural, but think about when we look at codes, we always want to read the definition and this says supervalvular aortography. 
So the physician said I did an aortogram. They didn't really give you a location. You're finding ascending information. And super means right above and valve means right above the valve. So it's right above the valve injection, which is the aortography. So if you're coming out of the heart, you're right above the aortic valve. Sometimes it's easier to read between the lines than it is to go back and query the physician. So that's what I would do on that one. Number three talks about STEMI versus non-STEMI acute MI. So some of you may not understand this, except just knowing that a STEMI heart attack is bad and takes the patient to the ER emergently. But let me just explain what that is. And this is in the I-10 section, I-21. So AMI is acute MI. STEMI means ST segment elevation of a myocardial infarction. Okay. Non-STEMI means that there's less serious form of an MI. So that, that basically it doesn't necessarily show a change in the ST elevation. So STEMI means that it's a serious form of a heart attack where the coronary artery is completely blocked and a large part of the heart muscle is unable to receive blood. And very quickly, the heart starts to have problems and that's when the patient basically clutches their heart. Non-STEMI, the non-serious form of MI, um, again, doesn't necessarily show, show change in the ST elevation on an EKG. Usually you're going to see something like high troponin levels, um, and that's the nanograms per milligram of blood, um, or white cell count, and that's going to be high. And a lot of times the doctors will call this ACS or acute coronary syndrome. This is a big deal because there is a specific code for stenting or intervention for during an MI, so acute MI, 92941, and then you can't use that if it's non-STEMI because the patient probably had within the last 6 to 12 hours a heart attack, but you don't know, you know, when that was. And that code says during. So again, that's the difference between STEMI and non-STEMI. So just know in case you're wondering. And STEMI, just from a layperson, it means that the EKG is going up and down crazy. And the non-STEMI means that it's really not, but you know that there's changes of an abnormality that you've got to figure out. And you're usually looking more at the uh, lab results um, for that patient. Number four, how do I code a PCI of the LAD? Well, some of you that are not cardiology-based, PCI is a percutaneous transluminal coronary intervention. So it means, means we're accessing the patient typically through the radial, the wrist, or the groin area, and we're doing it through a sheath and a catheter placement percutaneously. Um, and then we are manipulating that catheter in with some kind of a balloon tip device to try to open that narrowed artery. So the intervention, again, when we get into that in the LAD, left anterior descending artery, the intervention comes in three different ways. It comes in a stent form, an angioplasty form, or an atherectomy. Okay, so a stent basically comes in many forms, but it's very tiny, but it basically is a a fastener. And what that does is it it opens up the vessel and then pushes kind of like a, a fitted sheet that you're um, making sure it closes around that mattress. It's a, a fastener that makes a smooth area there and pushes that disease against the wall. And that code starts at 92928. And angioplasty is just what it's called a balloon. It means that narrowed vessel or that vessel that is kind of closed off is needs to be opened. And to do that, they need to inflate it just like a balloon. And so that's why it's called a balloon angioplasty. And so the provider will inflate or insert the balloon on a catheter tip and then open up that narrowed vessel, try to get it to a more normal diameter. And then the third one is atherectomy. Now we're going to read the code again, atherectomy. So what does that mean? Well, the prefix ather means atherosclerosis, so that's disease. And ectomy means what? It means to take out. So what are we doing? We're taking out the disease. And typically that's done with a balloon tipped or a blade tipped or a burr tipped. So that means that we're going through and kind of, it reminds me back in the day, you've seen those, uh, those edgers on the side of your lawn where it just kind of goes through, kind of edges out. It reminds me of that, where they go through with the burr and just try to get things out of there, chopping through that that disease, and then they drop it in a basket and pull it out. Now, angioplasty is included in all of these services. So if you, you might see some pre- and post-stent angioplasty, you can't code an, an addition, or pre- and post-stent, or I'm sorry, pre- and post-atherectomy as well, because you get floaters with atherectomy since you're cutting through. And so they'll pre and post it, you know, pre to open up the vessel and post to get rid of the floaters. And so again, those codes start at 92928 for stent, 92920 for angioplasty, 
and 9294 for atherectomy. But there's one lesson to learn when it comes to coding for interventions. And if you don't learn anything else, learn this. You code by vessel, not by intervention. So if your physician puts in five stents, do not use that code 92928 unless you're in a separate vessel multiple times. So if you are in, let's say, the left anterior descending artery, or you are in the right coronary, or any vessel, and you put in any single vessel, and you put in more than one stent, it's only one code. So please do not overcode that. And the number five has to talk about uh, anticoagulant management. So what is actually anticoagulant management? So you're going to have patients that um, definitely have some issues when it comes to their blood clotting. And when that happens, those patients need to have management for that blood clotting. And otherwise, that patient could be at high risk for a stroke. And, you know, you just don't want to have that happen. So and a stroke basically means the blood supply to the brain was interrupted. And it usually means a clot. And so a lot of patients that have valvular disease or atrial fibrillation are of high risk for that. So what they'll do is they'll put them on an anticoagulant medication. Well, not all medications need to be managed quite as closely as something like Coumadin, for example. And so when, when that is the, um, the choice medicine, you have a couple of different options. And typically, uh, what offices used to be coding before last year is they were coding an office visit and then maybe a lab test. Well, now we have our own dedicated code and it's 93793. And that says anticoagulant management for a patient taking warfarin. So it has to be a warfarin type, um, medication must include review and interpretation of a new home, office, or lab. So that's an INR test. So that's an international normalized ratio. So it's the levels. Patient instructions, dosage adjustment is needed, and scheduling of additional tests when performed. So it, the patient can be at home, and you can still bill it as a, as a place of service 11. They can be in your office, um, or you basically you're doing a review and interpretation of that lab test. But you have to make sure you have documentation of that conversation, of what the patient was told, the instructions, and any doses adjustment. Now, if you also process the lab, the dr blood draw in your office, in addition to the 93793, you get to code the 85610. If you do not, and they're sent out to either a, you know, external lab or from their home, their caregivers doing it, then you can't code anything extra for that. So only the 93793. Make sure that you're showing medical necessity because the critical nature of thinning blood and it's reducing and reducing its clotting factor does require constant oversight and INR testing and medication to be adjusted as needed. And also patient needs to be reminded as, you know, dietary needs and observe for possible bruising, but you can't overutilize it. So make sure that if the patient comes back with several normal uh, levels, their INR test, then and they call it also a pro time that you're not overutilizing that code. So right now we don't have frequency guidelines, but I can tell that they're coming. So just be aware of that. Okay, so I want to get to my kind of coding question that came up. And this is something that I'm going to lead into this because I'm still seeing so many practices that have not started the process yet on your 2021 ENM coding. And I'm going to keep bugging you about it because now we're at the end of September. It's three months away, guys. So you really have to get the understanding of the changes for your office and other outpatient visits. This is what you do. This is your bread and butter. So you've got to get that. Whether you use AP, AAPC's uh, training or my training, which now we have um, two of the three modules ready for you if you decide to do that and it's online, which you can download it on t at terryfletcher.net. Um, or you want to get somebody to, I'm doing a lot of private uh, updates as well, just so you can ask questions. So we have it on demand or not, but here's one of the questions that comes up. So in the proposed fee schedule, CMS issued a placeholder code that was used to report uh, services 99XXX, and this was for the new prolonged service code, which was for 15 minutes above and beyond the uh, visit. Well, it was different, I noticed, now that we have the release of the new CPT codes. The release in June of 2019, also the official uh, direction from Medicare, had said that you're going to use this code when the total time above and beyond the level five uh, reflected an additional 15 minutes. And so is it above the total time? 
Well, I've noticed now that they say beyond the minimum required time. Well, that's CPT. Medicare is not going to go for that. They're going to go, they're going to say it's past the, in, um, the threshold time of the total time of that visit. And remember, now we've got ranges for time for 2021. So if you take our courses, we'll show you how to use that code. But the 99417 now isn't taking the place of the placeholder code. And the description is a lot different than what the pr- proposal said. So I was kind of surprised about that. And Medicare and AMA, I knew it was going to happen. They don't agree on how to use it. And so that can also be not just a risk, but it's going to be a little bit of a headache for your practice. So make sure that you are getting your updates, that you're starting the process on the training soon because it's, it's really, it's really going to be interesting how this is all going to pan out with the changes. Our coding question was brought to you today by Charles Schwab, be a more informed investor. Follow us for news and insight to help you own your own tomorrow about schwab.com. Okay. So my personal tidbit this week. So I'm recording today on a Saturday and once a month I belong to, and I think I've told you about this before, something called a podcast brunch club. And it's, it's a book club for podcasters. I know I'm a little obsessed, but we have a theme every month. And this month was freedom of speech. How apropos with what's going on in the world. And so they give us five podcasts to watch. And I didn't like two of them. I thought, well, these are dumb, but there was three that I thought were very interesting. And they basically showed a balanced piece on freedom of speech. But this is what I wanted to talk to you just to tell you kind of something that happened. So on the call, there's myself who's from California. I'm the only one in California on the call. Um, and we limited to 10. There was somebody from France, somebody from Germany, uh, two people from China. And there was one person from Japan, one person from New Zealand, one from Australia, and then somebody from New York. And I think somebody from Pennsylvania. So we were, you know, well represented all over the, the world, actually. But here was something that was interesting. You know, my take on the podcast they had us listen to were like, well, you know, I didn't think too much about the one piece because the podcast interviewer kept interrupting the person that was podcasting saying, you know, well, you're wrong instead of listening to what they had to say. And it was about race issues. So I thought that was, that was just, you know, the whole point of the podcast was to talk about freedom of speech and have a conversation. So that was interesting. But what I thought was really interesting is they were one of the other podcasts, of course, was talking about the political climate. And without me getting all political on you, I just wanted to put something out there that I just thought was very thought provoking. Two of the gals that were on the call from China, they basically were allowed to raise our hand on the zoom call and come in and talk about it. So we're all chatting about, you know, the freedom of speech and everything and how everybody's kind of bashing the president or bashing the other side. And basically everybody's bashing everybody right now. And two of the gals from China basically raised their hand and both came in at the same time. And they're like, Well, that's what's different about China. First of all, we don't have a constitution and you don't have rights here when it comes to freedom of speech. You can say it, but if you say anything against the uh, government, you are what we call, you're erased. And we all got very quiet. And I said, you're what? And they're like, yeah, you kind of just disappear. You're erased. You can't say anything against our government here. And everybody knows that. So you make sure that you do not. And so I just want you to think about that. And, you know, I I do because I wasn't sure if I was going to bring that up. But the reason I want you to think about that is because if you see anybody complaining about our country, let them know this is something that isn't allowed in other countries. You have the right to say what you want to say. There may be consequences to it, but you have the right to say it. So anyway, I'm going to end on that note. But I just felt it was important in the times that we're having right now you know, just really understanding that we live in a great country and I hope everybody thinks so too. And, um, I'm just, I'm just really thankful for, for having the right to do what we do and to even podcast and even talk about it. And I hope everyone else is, is appreciative of that right as well. All right, everyone have a great week and a great rest of your month. And I'll talk to you in October. So thank you for listening to the CodeCast podcast. For more information on medical coding, billing, auditing and compliance, including how to hire Terry. Follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma. 
music producer, Assassin Music.